Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this, the first lecture in, in the four lecture series that the Preservation Society is presenting to mark the 250th anniversary of the Robert Longhouse. And tonight we have the honor of, of, of having Ed Pappenfos, who for 40 years guided and directed the, the efforts of the state of Maryland in gathering historic data on houses, people, dates, times. I mean, the, the state has great, his knowledge of historic events and places under Ed's leadership has greatly evolved and, and has been greatly enhanced during his time as a state archivist. So Ed knows, so Ed knows everything there is to know about the state of Maryland. About everything. Not, and some of it you can't publish, I'm sure. That's true. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to introduce Ed Pappenfuss. And, um, you know, Ed's got a great uh, presentation lined up. Ed, thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good evening, everybody. Uh, that was too good an introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I've seen some good friends in the audience who were turned up. Thanks for coming. My talk tonight is, is really about lost neighborhoods. One of the things that I've been really quite interested in of late is trying to make it clear that we have an awful lot of history about our communities, about our neighborhoods, about our blocks, about our streets that we really don't know about. And that we ought to spend more time thinking about the world in which we live and the history that is represented by what has happened in those spaces, those places, over time. So in a sense, my talk tonight is a belated valentine to Jane Bias Travers and the occupants of Ann and Fountain Street, Fells Point, during the most prosperous days of shipbuilding and sail. History is best told in stories that resonate with the listener, whether it is through the written word or the virtual world of interactive websites and digital productions of sound and images. While how well history is presented is the key to good history, mastering the sources with sufficient imagination to fill in the gaps of what can or can't be known is critical to even a modicum of success in creating and keeping an audience online or awake in the lecture hall. Recently, the British Museum teamed up with the virtual construction software company called Minecraft. How many of you have nieces, nephews, and grandchildren that play Minecraft? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, we have three grandchildren who uh, enjoy it and play it ages uh, from about 13 to six and a half. At any rate, Minecraft is now owned by Microsoft, and they are encouraging people to build their own imaginary museums of history. In particular, recreating their own British Museum, because they're doing it in conjunction with the British Museum. There you are enticed to create rooms full of museum exhibits, explaining to your viewers what there is to see and why it is important, whether it be the Rosetta Stone, or simple wooden devices created by a white slave owner on Maryland's eastern shore for making Maryland beaten biscuits, which his slaves sold for him here at Fells Point for cash. Perhaps the occupants of 812 Ann Street actually owned one. Hopefully someday this concept of personal museum building will be extended to the creation of sustainable electronic archives, in which not only will the sources of history be accessible online, but also it will contain a perpetual, dynamic, and growing library of scholarship written within those virtual museum walls that can be mined for new stories and the retelling of old. For example, a number of years ago, I was asked to tell the story of a house in Annapolis, which had a remarkable history attached to it, most of which with careful digging and a wide variety of fragmentary sources, was proven wrong. <laughs> if you like, you can find the, the story of this house online. I replaced it by an even more remarkable story. Fortunately, when asked to interpret the early history of one house in Fells Point, 812 Ann Street, the sources did not undermine the existing interpretation, but rather proved a sparse yet enticing beginning for a study of its occupants and their neighbors. 
It is a history that abounds in aggressive entrepreneurial activity by every level of society in search of fortune and personal freedom. It is a history in which a thirst for knowledge and the skills to achieve it are paramount, as is the desire to display the newly acquired wealth in conspicuous consumption and the ownership of property, both real and personal, which in a slave-based economy would prove to have dire consequences for the society as a whole. When the first major bubble of economic expansion in Baltimore burst in the banking scandal of 1817, Betsy Patterson Bonaparte, the daughter of one of the wealthiest merchants in Baltimore and the rejected bride of Napoleon's brother, wrote her own brother her view of why the high flyers of commerce and banking were ruined. To quote Betsy, one merchant by this tragical event of the banking scandal has been severely punished for the folly which led him to build and furnish with regal magnificence a palace. I am sorry to express my conviction that General Sam Smith's fine house and the extravagant mode of living he introduced into Baltimore caused the ruin of half the people in the place, who without his example would have been contented to live in habitations better suited to their fortunes. And certainly they only made themselves ridiculous by aping expenses little suited to a community of people of business. It is to be hoped that in the future there will be no places, palaces, excuse me, constructed as there appears to be a fatality attending their owners, beginning with Robert Morris and ending with Lemuel Taylor. I do not recall a single instance, except that of William Bingham, of anyone who built a palace in America not dying a bankrupt. When attempting to piece together the stories of a neighborhood such as that of Ann Street or of Fountain Street, it is helpful to have a series of good maps and survey, surveys that graphically and accurately depict the lay of the land and the buildings on the streets and in the alleyways. Baltimore is fortunate in that it had a succession of engineers and surveyors who tried to accurately map the city as it developed and persistently reshaped its urban landscape. The first two were Frenchmen, refugees from the slave revolts in the French West Indies and the revolution in France, A.J. Foley and Charles Verlaine. They were followed by Thomas Poppleton, an Englishman, some have said a mad Englishman, and Fielding Lucas, whose work was mostly derivative from Poppleton's map although Lucas's map proved to be more accurate as to the waterfront in Fells Point as it was in the 1820s than Poppleton's map, whose remarkable survey of 1822 was intended to show the configuration of blocks not yet staked or, or not yet developed, including fill land along the waterfront, and that, as yet, did not exist. The best example is the shipyard basin into which Alice Ann ended before it was filled in and the street extended. What Poppleton shows is fast land did not materialize there until the 1830s. It was here that some of the most famous of the Baltimore privateers were built by Thomas Kemp, who came to Baltimore in 1805 from the Eastern Shore and with his partners, Robeson and George Gardner, continued to build in the basin well after Poppleton's map was published, indicating that much of the basin to the east of the point, according to Poppleton, had already been filled in. Still, Poppleton's map is so well executed that it can be overlaid on Google Earth with remarkable accuracy. In 1855, Poppleton's map was reissued with corrections and the addition of the lots created from fill and beyond those that had been called for in the original edition being shown very accurately on the map. It, too, overlays very well on Google Earth. For the purposes of this story, the focus on residents of two neighborhoods during the first 60 years of the history of Fells Point, that of Anne and Fountain Streets, <clears throat> as well as brief reference to three of the many wharves that populated the waterfront of Fells Point, one of which persisted into the second half of the 20th century, another that had a short life ended by the torrential rains of 1817, never to be rebuilt, and the third which figured prominently in the domestic slave trade. For orientation purposes without access to Google, Google Earth online, the map you have before you, Fielding Lucas's map of 1822, works best. An annotated detail of which follows here and is presented to you and is keyed. I'll just show you the uh, outline of the map here. Uh, as you can see, 
I've added a whole bunch of arrows to take you to the places that I'm going to talk to about tonight. So if you follow the colored arrows, you can go to Kemp Shipyard, uh, you can go to 812 Ann Street, you can go to Fountain Street, the Mystery Street, you can go to Jackson's Wharf, where Austin Bullfook exported slaves. You can go to Philpot Street, where Captain John Smith, who I'll talk about and who was not related to the original Captain John Smith, as far as we know, uh, lived. I suspect you're all familiar with this photograph, which was first published in the 1930s in a book about uh, the importance of the history of Fells Point. It notes that the house at 812 South Ann Street, which the records show was a very old house in 1797. <laughs> that indeed it was. In the last quarter of the 20th century, Robert Eney, with the able assistance of a large number of people, including the late Bryden Hyde and Mark Mike Tressel, both distinguished architects and architectural historians, reversed the late 19th century edition of a third story to 812 Ann Street seen here in that 1930s publication, and revealed the wonderful small two-story brick structure which is now so visible in person and on Google Earth. This is the image you'll find at the moment of the house on Google Earth. The story of the first owner of the Robert Long House has long been known as far as the records known to date reveal him, although describing him as a merchant at the time in 1781 that he sold the house to William Travers might not suit him as well as calling him a builder. The 18th century equivalent of a modern day developer whose success by 1781 permitted him in the deed when he sold the house to refer to himself as a gentleman. He says as much about his building career in his own words in 1782 when he deposes that quote sometime in the year and this is a, a quote from Robert Long Sometime in the year 1763, I came to Fells Point with a view to settle and purchase some lots. That the streets were staked out at the corners by having two stakes at each corner and one stake between every lot. He goes on to explain that he assisted in laying out the foundation, personally laid out the foundation of several houses. Two in specific that he actually delineates in his deposition. Not including his own, by the way. It is likely that Robert Long never lived in this house for long at all, but built it for rental purposes. When he married a rich widow, Mary Norwood, he placed the house, lot 145 and its contents and its slaves, in trust for his bride as a part of the marriage contract in case they had a falling out and the marriage failed. The marriage lasted and she may have lived in the house with the furniture and slaves but only for at best seven years during the American Revolution until her husband sold it and the lot to William Travers, probably a merchant originally from Maryland's Dorchester County on the Eastern Shore in 1781. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Peter's, Pierre's prevent, providing me with the title search for this as well as the uh, uh, title search that came from the Preservation Society. I hope some of you who know shipbuilding in this area will for, uh, forgive me for showing this uh, print, or actually this watercolor from Massachusetts. Uh, however, I think it is actually showing a, Mar a Maryland ship, though I haven't been able to prove it. Chasseur. Pardon? Chasseur. I, no, it's not the Chasseur, I don't think. But, okay. And the story of this ship is a fascinating one, but uh, I shouldn't take you there tonight. What I really want to do is to talk a bit more about the point. And while the point had begun to grow as a center of wheat and flour expo exports by the Declaration of Independence, most of the activity of the point during the American Revolution was focused on pr the privateering exploits of its merchants and ship captains. It is with the Revolution that Baltimore and especially the merchants and ship captains of Fells Point began to earn their reputation as government sanctioned pirates on the high seas, raiding British shipping and engaging in a clandestine trade with the West Indies. In 1906, Charles Henry Lincoln compiled his list of the naval records of the American Revolution, a list that the Pratt, at that Pratt librarian Bernard Christian Steiner drew on for his Maryland Historical Magazine article on the Maryland privateers during the American Revolution. Beginning with the registration of privateers in 1778, the first 
41 letters of Mark empowering Maryland ships to act as American government sanctioned privateers were issued to Baltimore owners, masters, and charterers of ships. The port also became a depot for supplying the American army with flour, an activity that led to charges, possibly true, that a leading lawyer and member of Congress from Maryland, Samuel Chase, used his insider information to corner and profit from the market in wheat. Baltimore and the Point, from its earliest beginnings, had a reputation for speculation and pushing the envelope of permissible trade that would stay with it well into the 19th century, especially in relationship to dealing with rebels in South America in their fight against the Spanish rule after the War of 1812, which caused enormous uh, discord within the American government that was attempting to prevent the Baltimoreans from doing what they were doing and supplying uh, the rebels in South America. The most dramatic and prolonged expansion of the mercantile and shipbuilding activities of the point would take place after the defeat of the British in 1781, witnessed by the occupants, uh, and that expansion would have been witnessed by the occupants of 812 Ann Street. It is to the Travers family, and in particularly Jane Bias Travers, 1758-1845, that credit should go for living in the house on Ann Street for the longest of any single occupant, possibly beginning as early as her marriage to Matthew Travers in seven, September of 1784. That was about the time William Travers deeded the house to his two sons, Henry and Matthew, both of whom were ship captains in the employ of two brothers, Joseph and James Bias. Although there is no direct proof that Jane was their sister, the circumstantial evidence that she was is very strong including the care with which Joseph Bias protected her interest in the house prior to her husband's disappearing. Initially, Captain Matthew Travers's earliest address, 1796, is given in the directories as being on George, now Thames Street. And he did own outright a portion of a lot on the street from his father. But it is not clear that there was anything built on it until after he sold it and it is quite possible that the garden of 812 Ann Street, then numbered 3 Ann Street, ran down to George Street, misleading the compiler of the directory as to what address to specify. In any event, by 1803, Matthew and Jane Travers were definitely living in the house in what is now 812 Ann Street. Matthew disappeared around 1811, probably at sea. Jane remained in the house until she died 34 years later, in 1845, raising at least four daughters in the meantime. Jane was literate and a respected member of the community, so much so that while Matthew was away, she was the only woman resident in 1797 to sign a petition to the mayor and city council to do something about the, quote, stagnated water on George Street, quote, that in the hot season renders it unhealthy in that neighborhood, end of quote. Her brother James Bias signed it as well. This is the petition, which you obviously can't read from there, but I will show you in a moment uh, Jane's signature on the petition. petition. Uh, this is one of those remarkable records that, that people hardly ever use in the Baltimore City Archives that document the uh, story of the interaction between government and the city. Uh, throughout the 18th, late 18th through the 19th century on into the 20th century. The summers in Fells Point could be brutal and deadly, as evidenced by the yellow fever epidemic of 1800. It is possible that Jane escaped to James Bias's estate in what is now the Waverly section of Baltimore, but then was in Baltimore County, which he named Mount Jefferson, reflective of his deep attachment to the president and his party. If you prospered in Baltimore, the pattern was to invest, pardon? Yeah. It's the ghost of the house. Very shortly, you'll see a horse. Uh, no, excuse me. If you, Jane coming back. Jane coming back. She does. If you prospered in Baltimore, the pattern was to invest in a farm or an estate in Baltimore County. Although some, such as the shipbuilder Thomas Kent, and the Winder family, sometimes pronounced Winder, and I'm sure I don't know which, found their, reply, their respites, respites uh, 
on the eastern shore. Indeed, there's a remarkable coincidence, if not irony, in the fact that the Talbot County slave, Frederick Douglass, would begin acquiring the means to escape to freedom by working in the shipyard of Baltimore's, camped, Baltimore's camp's erstwhile partner, George Gardner, while, when he returned to Baltimore in 1836. After having suffered his worst treatment as a slave just over the fence from Thomas Kent's, Kemp's Talbot Country Estate. They were neighbors in more ways than one. As far as Jane Travers is concerned, I meant to at least show you her signature. How literate Jane Bias Travers was is not known. And the whole question of how women of her generation became educated, especially in Baltimore, has yet to be studied in any depth. Her sister-in-law, Susanna, 1767 to 1845, the widow of her husband's brother, Captain Henry Travers, was identified as a school teacher in the city directories until she died the same year as Jane, 1845, at the age of 78, nine years Jane's junior. The newspapers reveal that in the early years of the 19th century, there were a number of schools for women, and the Bias brothers received permission from the General Assembly to run a lottery to establish an academy for women. Whether or not it succeeded is presently not known. The white boys who populated the streets of Fells Point were able to read the newspapers. That's clear from Frederick Douglass's narrative of his life on Alisana and Philpott streets in the 1820s and 1830s, and that his white mistress, wife of the ship's carpenter and builder Hugh Auld, could read. But for the majority of the women who lived in Fells Point, there is no indication of how literate they were. A good guess is that more women than men could read and write in those seafaring times, when a majority of those who signed seamen's articles prior to a voyage could only sign with an X. I have spent some time looking at the prize papers at the Public Record Office, which is now called the National Archives of Great Britain, and going through all of the ships that were taken as prizes that came from Baltimore. This just happens to be one of the uh, Siemens articles for one of the ships, and it gives you a very clear idea that both the people who signed up to be on the ship and their wages, uh, also the people who gave bond for them, uh, were only half of them were literate or at least able to sign their own names. It is also not known whether Jane attended church, but the biases were active Presbyterians. Joseph had a pew in the first Presbyterian church in 1780, in the 1780s, when later James led a revolt and left with a portion of the congregation to form the second Presbyterian church because of, this, of a dispute over who should succeed the previous minister, Brother Joseph followed. You probably have all seen this image of the Second Presbyterian Church. Uh, the map that you have in front of you points to its uh, location in 1822. The pastor that James Bias and others chose for the new Second Presbyterian Church came highly recommended by none other than Thomas Jefferson for whom the biases were aggressive, and I mean aggressive, political supporters. Both Joseph and James served on the city council as Jeffersonian Democrats and were paid by the city for a multitude of civic, work, civic works projects, including the grading and paving of streets, the silt from which may have led in part to their financial undoing, as we shall learn later. In the careers of Henry and Matthew Travers, it is possible to catch a glimpse of, the, of <clears throat> the men and careers of the men who sailed the ships from Baltimore. Both Matthew, who lived in 812, and Henry were ship captains for the Bias brothers. Their activities are documented in the newspapers at the time. There were five dailies in Baltimore, by the way, by the War of 1812. <coughs> So there was a lot to read, and it, they thought there were a lot of people who could read them. Matthew and Henry, along with other captains that worked for James and Joyce Bias, uh, were pursued their careers that took them 
to Bordeaux that took them to the West Indies that engaged them in a whole range of trading activities which they brought back to the Bias Wharfs uh, in Fells Point. In many ways, the masthead of Joseph Esquivel's Crisis Current, which graced his first issue on Valentine's Day, 1803, could very well be an artistic rendition of Jane and Susanna Travers contemplating the fate and fortunes of their ship captain husbands. It's a remarkable woodcut. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, it is a thoughtful lady wistfully looking at two ships, one out at sea, one tied up at the, uh, at the dock. Uh, in the very next issue, he cuts the wood block in half and you only see uh, the woman and the ship in the distance. You do not see the, uh, the rear of the ship that you see here. Sadly, not all the issues of the newspapers of Jane's day have survived, and while a large number of those that have survived are online, a significant number of those that were probably read in Fells Point have not been, and are widely scattered in the inaccessible stacks of a number li of libraries out of state. An example is the radical newspaper The Whig, which probably contains advertisements and announcements related to Fells Point that were not carried by his competitors. While the surviving newspapers do tell us about politics in Jane's day, what they do tell us is the devotion of Fells Point to the party of Jeff Jefferson and United States Senator Sam Smith, the organizer of Baltimore's successful defense against the British in 1814, and the last mayor of Baltimore known to ride horseback to face down one of the crowds that gave Baltimore the national reputation of being a mob town. The editor of the Federal Republican newspaper, Alexander Conti Hansen, would, James, would blame James Bias for the attack on and the destruction of his printing press in the summer of 1812. The vitriol that Hansen spread across the paper, pages of his newspaper in attacking the administration's path to war with Britain was too much for the residents of Fells Point and elsewhere in the city. He was not the first person in town to suggest that mo the mob was more than was more an organized, politically motivated expression of democracy than an ill-educated group of drunks on a rampage. One of the first organized protests against the British impressing American seamen for the British Navy, a protest about the disruption of American trade by the British, was in Fells Point in 1810, three years before an American ship, the schooner Nimrod of Baltimore Registry, was in port returned from a voyage to the West Indies with a cargo of sugar, cocoa, coffee, sarsaparilla, and hides. hides. When it went to sea again, it carried a Spanish certificate that was intended, illegal from the standpoint of American maritime law, to provide it with some protection against capture by the British, as it was probably carrying a cargo of flour intended <coughs> to feed Wellington's army. The ruse did not work and the Nimrod was captured and sold as a prize to the British Navy, which in turn converted it uh, to one of its cutter class, sending it to Baltimore for supplies and possibly dispatches in 1810. The story of what happened when the Netley, formerly the Baltimore schooner, the Nimrod, arrived in port went viral, making <coughs> newspapers all over the country from Savannah to Boston. Isaac Monroe, who in 1812 would, become, would come to Baltimore as a Republican editor and founder, owner of the Baltimore Patriot, was in 1810 editor of the Boston Patriot newspaper. Recently, a volume of the issues of his paper was sold at auction for $1,150, among which was this editorial about the Netley. British arrogance. It is probable that the British cutter Netley was sent to Baltimore to insult us because we are told she was once a Baltimore schooner, the Nimrod, taken by the British and since cut and meddled into her present hermaphrodite shape because she came here ostensibly for Copenhagen Jackson, who was known not to be here, and because she brought some impressed American sailors with her and had the audacity to tantalize them with a view of their own native shores. This latter circumstance being named, made known to the public sea boys at the point, 
a deputation waited on the lieutenant of the Nedley and demanded the release of a Marylander detained in port. The lieutenant demurred, and but one hour was allowed for him to decide. This bold summons was obeyed. The poor sailor was released, and after, after being 16 years impressed on a British ship, his friends are said to reside on the eastern shore. He made seven unsuccessful attempts to escape and was often lacerated, meaning whipped, for his pains. Could it be ascertained, as it is suspected, that this is the same vessel on board which Captain Ryder was taken and flogged? There is spirit enough among our seamen the point, to blow her up, but the proof not being clear, they practice their usual moderation. <laughs> By the way, Francis James Copenhagen Jackson was a British minister to the United States. He had negotiated with the neutral Danes to join the British. The British then led a surprise attack on Copenhagen and burned it in 1807 after, the De after Denmark tried to maintain her neutrality. Thus, with James Bias at its head, an organized posse of residents of Fells Point visited the Netley and freed the sailor. James Bias claimed that it was all done properly, without violence, but the anti-Jefferson editor of the Maryland Republican was far from convinced. Alexander Conti Hansen, Jr. wrote a flaming editorial about Bias's own published account of the Netley incident in his September 19, 1810 issue of the Federal Republican. Quote, James Bias, of Fells Point, a notorious coward and unprincipled bully, has issued one of the most false, insolent, and seditious publications witnessed since the days of Robespierre and the revolutionary histories of the Parisian suburbs. In conclusion, he threatens us with the sanguinary vengeance of the point. We wish this wretched patron and leader of mobs to understand once and for all that we should despise ourselves if we did not defy him and all his adherents. <laughs> Three days later, in another editorial, Hansen excoriates the Fells Point rabble, and again denies that the reception of the Netley was anything but peaceful. It is no wonder that as a leader of the local militia, referred to as major and then later as colonel when he was active in the defense of the city in 1814, that James Bias was involved in the thick of the attack on Hansen's printing press in the summer of 1812. A clear riot that soon escalated into the assault on the jail, the severe beating of Hansen, and the death of a Revolutionary War hero who happened also to be a staunch Federalist. There is no question that for nearly a quarter of a century, the Bias brothers played an instrumental role in the politics of Fells Point. As early as 1798, they were actively engaged in advocating active political partic participation of the mechanics and manufacturers of the city and precincts of Baltimore. At a mass meeting in September 1798 with James Bias in the chair, those assembled vowed to resist, quote, the unwarrantable and degrading means that have been adopted and resorted to by some persons to influence us in the upcoming congressional elections. The Bias brothers made their fortunes in the commodity export and import trade that was centered at Fells Point and was the major factor in the growth of the city following the American Revolution. The single most important exports were wheat and flour. The demand for housing at the point accounts for why the Pennsylvania builder, Robert Long, came to Fells Point and invested in the lots laid out under the auspices of Ann Fell, wife of the owner of the point. He and other Pennsylvania imports, such as Dr. Henry Stevenson, and a raft of others, along with local investors, like the Catholic and Protestant Charles Carrolls, recognized that the wheat produced in western and central Pennsylvania and the conversion to wheat of the tobacco plantations of Maryland's eastern shore could make Baltimore and surrounding mills into a major factor in the export to the West Indies and southern Europe of American wheat and flour, drawing to it a large urban population in need of housing. In return, the commodities and finished goods purchased with the proceeds of the export trade would accelerate the import trade for consumption by the local population and distribution to the interior of the country, first by the waterways and the National Road, and then by canals and the railroads, financed in part by investors from the city. The results in the growth of the city and personal fortunes were phenomenal, especially when combined in the years leading up to the War of 1812 with the re-export trade as a neutral power acting as a carrier and supplier for all sides in the conflict during the Napoleonic Wars. 
In population and export figures alone, the growth of the Baltimore City with the bulk of trade and ship building focused on Fells Point was dramatic. It grew from a few houses and a couple of ships in 1765 to a population citywide of 50,000 people and hundreds of ships, many of which were locally built by the time of the British blockade of 1813-1814. Jane's husband, Matthew Travers, and his brother Henry are typical examples of entrepreneurial ship captains. They commanded ships that traded for cargoes of wine at Bordeaux, sugar, coffee, and hides from the West Indies and from the coast of Central America. They had considerable independence and often carried cargoes of their own for sale on their own account. account. Sometimes they disobeyed orders, and that got them into trouble. Henry Travers was sued by his employers for not following their instructions. Sometimes they had a, lot, a bit of good luck, such as the time on his way to Savannah, George uh, Matthew <coughs> Travers came upon a ship abandoned at sea. He brought her into port as a salvage prize, which the Admiralty Court in Savannah awarded to him and was sold to his personal profit. The newspapers were very interested in this case of Matthews, and so you can find the whole story laid out uh, in the Georgia Gazette of Savannah for, October, uh, for December of 1789. Sometimes the captains felt they did not get the compensation they deserved. Consider the case of Captain John Smith, who lived on Philpot Street and sailed in partnership with James Bias. He became quite a disillusion with James, suing him in the Chancery Court for about $70,000 in back pay for services rendered the bias firm. The case deserves a story of its own and contains a well-documented history of the voyages of many ships under Smith's command, including an audited account of the profits attributed <clears throat> to each outgoing and incoming voyage. It will never be known how the case was settled, but it was out of court and the papers submitted by both sides lay in a folded case file unrecor unrecorded and undiscovered until some interns working for me found them in the 1970s at the Maryland State Archives. If you like, you can follow the details of the case because I've placed them online and you can see all of the papers as they related to the ships. Among the letters introduced as evidence in the case is one addressed to Mrs. Smith on Philpot Street which demonstrates the literacy and the affection of both, as well as his concern for the health and welfare of his recovering daughter. Smith wrote from the Port of Philadelphia to quote his loving wife. The letter is well worth reading in its entirety. It is a, in a nicely formed, well-spelled, and largely grammatically correct hand. It illuminates the ways in which the captain handled commissions and receipts of sales, and it makes clear the ways in which ship captains communicated with each other, uh, carrying news back to the point about their activities. He even gives instructions on what he expected his wife to oversee at the country seat, including put it in, putting it in good order, planting good trees for them that is broke, and that she should try to rent the old house for any sum. This is just one page, and this is the second page of his letter to his wife. When Jane Bias Travers left the house on Ann Street and walked north to Fleet Street, over the, ho over the course of her nearly 50 years as a resident, she would have seen little change in the composition of the neighborhood until near the, very near the end of her life in 1845. The names would change, but the occupations remained virtually the same. From the city directories, which are now all searchable online, it is possible to reconstruct who lived where and their occupations with a reasonable degree of accuracy, subject, of course, to the vagaries of the directories themselves, which are often riddled with phonetic spellings and some years more complete than others. Only in 1804 did the compiler of the city directory take the time to organize the entries by street and street address. All other directories were alphabetical uh, by individual name. This is the page showing part of Ann Street and shows you that you can actually walk along with the directory and really find where people were living on each of the blocks. Uh, I simply have included a bit of Fountain Street because I was really rather interested in the fact that B. Davis was Warfinger and keeper of the fountain and everybody else was involved in dealing with the uh, the whole question of building ships or related to the shipbuilding trade. 
Uh, if you wanted to, and you had to the time, you could actually begin to build some very wonderfully layered and time and space maps of who lived where and what they at least had occupations associated with them. And walking up Ann Street towards Alisana and Fleet Streets, Jane Bias Travers would pass boarding houses for sailors, corner stores, and taverns, and the homes of ship captains, ship carpenters, rope makers, scriveners, butchers, customs officials, and a schoolmistress. In 1819, she might stop at the house north of Alicenna on the east side that was occupied by ship captain Richard Johns, and may also have been the home for a time of a relative, Captain John Cox. Captain John Cock disappears from sight, perhaps at sea, after the death, the tragic death, of his young son in 1818, leaving to his relatives watercolors of his ship, the Canada, depicted on a voyage to Bordeaux in 1817, as well as a painting by the black portrait artist Joshua Johnson of Cock's deceased son, Richard Johns Cock, that could well have been hanging on the walls of Captain Richard Johns' house on Ann Street. This is one of uh, three watercolors uh, that were actually produced by a passenger who was uh, very grateful to John Cock, Captain Cock, getting him to Bordeaux, um, a French passenger. By the way, these are just simply lying in the vault of the Maryland State Archives, and they are basically unknown examples of uh, art relevant to the history of Fells Point. And this, by the way, is Richard John Cox. He uh, was the son of John Cox. His mother was a Johns. And it is to the Johns family that these uh, watercolors and this painting descend. I had the privilege of actually handling the sale of this painting after someone tried to uh, steal it from the owner for a very small sum. Uh, and we managed to receive enough funds to help her uh, retire, uh, which is, was one of the things that was really important uh, in a life that did not have much in the way of her retirement income. Um, it is a painting after death. And you can tell because of the butterfly, because that was a symbol of death. So this was painted after the young boy died in 1818. Uh, further on Ann Street, Jane might turn the corner on Fleet Street, walking east toward the water of one of the busiest shipbuilding basins in the city, a basin that has largely been forgotten and ignored in terms of the history of the shipbuilding industry of this city, of, this, of the point. Looking closely at Foley's, and I have difficulty pronouncing his name, the French engineer's map of 1792 of the point, there is a bluff or near the intersection of Fleet and Washington Street. See this bluff right here? Now Foley was a very good engineer, and this map is so accurate that if you overlay it on Google Earth, you can actually see where the original streets ran in relationship to today's streets. So I have no doubt that he was, in fact, showing the geography of the basin in a very uh, reasonable and accurate way. Slightly below this bluff or hill, slightly below this, James and Joseph Bias leased the rights to the land, all to the south of this bluff. They subleased it in turn in 1805, part of it, to one of the best known and most prolific shipbuilders of the day, Thomas Kemp, 1779-1824. There, Kemp and his partners built some of the fastest and best-known privateers of the War of 1812, for example, the Chasseur, better known as the Pride of Baltimore. According to Tony Aaron's carefully study, careful study, between 1805 and 1817, when Kemp retired to the shores of Talbot County, he had filed 64 required carpenter certificates for vessels that he had built on that, in that shipyard. And that wasn't all of them. It was only the ones that were required by the ship carpenters uh, certificates. He actually built some vessels for the uh, federal government, but that's another story. The property leased to Kemp lay 360 feet 
to the east of Washington Street between Fleet and Fountain Streets. The shipyard was to the south of the property, on the water of the cove or basin, as it was called, occupying fill land that probably became annexed to his leasehold property by adverse possession. The configuration of the properties on Fountain Street by 1826 can be seen in, in an overlay of Google Earth, and this will be probably difficult for you to see, but it'll at least give you the impression. Uh, the overlay on Google Earth of a plat that was submitted in a court case that reached the Supreme Court. Kemp's leasehold was to the north of Fountain Street at its very current, very eastern end. The shipyard was in all likelihood to the south, shown with a wharf on the plat. All that land was fill land as the edge of the basin had moved for, forward towards the harbor. Why? Well, in part, this map tells the tale, and it has to do with some terrific rainstorms, but we'll come back to that in a minute. As far as Kemp is concerned, he employed free blacks, slaves, he owned slaves. He's listed in the 1813, 1814 directory as having several, uh, tax list as having several, and white laborers at his shipyard. Initially, the neighborhood of Fountain Street was an integrated neighborhood of free blacks and whites, all associated with shipbuilding, except the keeper of the fountain, who first appears in the 1804 directory that we've seen as B. Davis, who also doubled as a keeper of a wharf. It is at the Kemp shipyard that Frederick Douglass first begins to learn the shipbuilding trade, although he did not become a skilled caulker of ships until he moved to the south to Price's shipyard. Price's shipyard was on the basin as well. After a bruising encounter with white apprentices at Kemp's and going home to his master, he moved to Price's shipyard. Jane Bias Travers' house on Ann Street was in the 8th ward. Thomas Kemp's shipyard was in the 7th. Both wards had slaves, according to the 1813 tax list, with 243 in the 8th ward and 472 in the 7th. Jane owned no slaves, according to the tax list. She may have been, she may have seen, and she may have even recognized Frederick Douglass, who had vivid memories of the slaves marched in the dead of night to the Savannah and New Orleans packets tied up at Jackson's Wharf off Thames Street, which lay next to James Bias's and Joseph Bias's old wharf. Their new wharf was built at the end of Alisana Street, south of the land they leased to Thomas Kemp. The packets to Savannah were run by the partnership of Henry Thompson, no less, of Clifton, Clifton Mansion fame, and Austin Woolfolk, who together placed ads soliciting slaves for export to Georgia and New Orleans as early as 1815. Most people who have studied Austin Woolfolk think that he really didn't get into going in business until after 1819. The earliest ad I have for him is uh, 1815 when he is buying slaves. When Douglas lived on Philpot Street and worked at the Kemp and Price shipyards, he wrote that, quote, in the deep still darkness of midnight, I have often been aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chained gangs that passed our door on their way to Jackson's Wharf. In fact, Jackson's Wharf may have been the site of the most famous of the abolitionist exposés of the slave trade that William Lloyd Garrison published in Baltimore, featuring one of Thompson's and Woolfolk's cargoes on board the Francis, a Rhode Island ship, by the way, destined for New Orleans uh, from the port of Fells Point. Garrison was sued for libel in the Baltimore County Court, and he fled to Boston to establish his newspaper, The Liberator, and to continue his crusade, leaving his mother behind in Baltimore, to whom he set an allowance, sent an allowance that she deposited regularly in the Bank of Baltimore. A typical example of the slave cargoes exported from Jackson's Wharf by Henry Thompson and Austin Bulkfoot were the 187 slaves sent to New Orleans aboard the Intelligence between 1821 and 1827. Of these, only 18 were identified by surnames, the rest by their given names. They included a number of infants and children, 
and, and one voyage in 1823 stopped at the very well-known Sotterley, Sotterley Plantation on the Patuxent River to pick up 29 slaves sent south for sale by John R. Plater. <coughs> if you're interested in pursuing that aspect of the history further, there's a very good book by Ralph Clayton called Cash for Blood, which gives all the names and all the ships that were engaged in the trade. Here is one of Henry Thompson's ads uh, for the intelligence. He was the owner of the ship that stopped and picked up the slaves at Sotterley. Back on Fountain Street, prior to 1817, the Bias brothers expanded their wharf at the end of Alice Anna Street and received permission from the city for a monopoly on delivering water from their spring to the residents of the point. In the Niles Register for 1813, the most highly regarded weekly journal of its day, Hezekiah Niles not only defends the city against those who would call it a mob town, he also waxes eloquent about the fountain and the Bias's efforts to supply the city with pure water. That part of the city denominated Fells Point, he wrote, where the water of the pumps was rarely found pure, has been lately supplied with spring water of the best quality by the liberal and spirited exertions of two individuals, Messrs. Joseph and James Bias, so that every family have it in their power, at a very moderate expense, to furnish themselves with this indispensable re requisite to the enjoyment of health. The city spring, as it is called, was purchased by the corporation in 1810, together with the lot on which it stood, and has been since walled up and covered with a neat circular building, the ground handsomely laid out and planted with trees of the most rare and curious species, a small goateen structure of stone erected for the accommodation of a man employed to keep the whole, Mr. Davis, in order, and the lot enclosed with a light railing. This beautiful spot is resorted to from almost every part of the city, and so much is the water esteemed for its purity that a man has for many years found himself profitably employed in carting it about the city for sale. Just where was this fountain? Where was it actually located? You know what? We don't know for sure. <laughs> the reason is probably the torrential rainstorm of 1817, which produced a freshet. You all know what a freshet is? A freshet is when the huge rainstorms come, fill up all the streams, the Jones Fall, with so much water that it rushes towards the harbor, carrying all kinds of debris, logs, silt, mud, it was a freshet so powerful in 1817, filled with mud and debris, that it resulted in the destruction of the Bias's new wharf at the end of Alisana Street, and the silting up of a number of wharves on the west side of the basin. We're very fortunate in that, even though nobody's really looked at them very carefully, uh, there are a lot of maps and plats at the Baltimore City Archives showing the changes in the city over time. Uh, this is just one of them. This is a Yehu Golden Platt of 1826 showing the loss of Bias's new wharf and the extension of Alice Anna Street over fill land below, below where the Kemp shipyard had been. Uh, if you were to blow it up, you could actually see that the word Bias is written on top of this little outcropping which shows his wharf and the wharf of his brother, Joseph. As far as the destructive freshet is concerned, it got a lot of news, and you can read about it in the newspaper. Uh, it prevented Henry Thompson from coming to town to sell off one of his slave ships, but uh, after it uh, ceased, he did manage to get there, and the auction was held. As far as the freshet was concerned, what it did was become the grounds of one of the most famous Supreme Court cases ever uh, brought before Chief Justice Marshall and was a deciding factor in terms of municipal rights uh, well into the 19th century and was only changed in terms of its interpretation by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. But in order to deal with the case, let's talk with it a little bit about what it was all about because the people who were most unhappy about what the consequences of this freshet were the owners of the Craig and Barron Wharf, which was to the south of Bias's Wharf, 
on the west edge of the basin. It was actually, as far as we can tell, was the Craig and Barron Wharf was between Tha uh, Thames Street and um, was above, just above Thames Street for about a full, full block. But anyway, this wharf was, uh, eventually that wharf was dug out. And as late as 1826, at that wharf, thousands of residents and slaves of the city, including Frederick Douglass, would witness the launching of a Brazilian-funded warship, initially called the Baltimore. That ship was so large that a sandbar in the, of silt in front of the wharf had to be dug out anew before it could sail down the bay, captained by none other than Navy Captain Franklin Buchanan of the U.S. and Confederate Navy fame, who did keep a journal of his voyage to Rio, which is now in the archives of the Naval Academy in Annapolis. That Craig and Barron were displeased by the mud that clogged their wharf and destroyed James Bias's wharf is an understatement. They instituted a suit for damages in the Baltimore County Court against the city, arguing that the grading of the streets by the city provided the dirt that was washed into the basin and took their livelihood away. A jury awarded them damages. We know, even know every member of the jury. They certainly were sympathetic uh, to the fact that this freshet had destroyed the business of Craig and Barron. The city appealed the case, and the Court of Appeals reversed the lower court in favor of the city. The lawyers for Craig and Barron then appealed to the Supreme Court under the provisions of the Fifth Amendment that required that no property can be taken without due process and just compensation. It was the last major case heard by Supreme Court Justice John Marshall. He refused to hear the case, and he actually told the lawyer for the city, Roger Burke Tawney, to sit down, <laughs> or so it was said. For an undetermined amount of time, uh, George Gardner continued to build ships at what had been the Kemp shipyard, which apparently was not as adversely affected by the freshet. But the fountain, as described by Niles, completely disappeared and was replaced in 1819 by the fountain at Pratt and Eden Street at a cost of the city of about $34,000. Uh, you can see an image of the fountain that replaced the Bias Fountain on Poppleton's map of 1822. Over time, and by 1833, the year Barron and versus Baltimore was dismissed by the Supreme Court, the marshy land to the south of Fountain Street was filled in, and Fountain Street itself extended to the length that it is today. And as you all know, in one hurricane, the waters returned. By the time Jane Tra Bias Travers died in 1845, the whole character of the point was changing. While ships continued to be repaired and built in its shipyards, the adventuresome nature of its trade and the entrepreneurial activities of its ship captain merchants were on a steep decline. If the summers had been bad on the health and the senses of the community before 1845, by the time of her death, guano as fertilizer had begun to appear piled high upon its wharves. While good for the depleted fields of rural Maryland, it gave a new and not very welcome dimension to the smells of summertime. As to the history of the lost neighborhoods and forgotten residents of Fells Point, the advent of the virtual world and the viability of permanent electronic archives mated with inexpensive space within which a collaboration of researchers and writers can work is at hand, if only those who need it are willing to make it so. With good base maps, continued assistance from Google for cloud storage, open source software, and Google Earth linked to a research and writing wiki, it will be possible to tell more and better stories about the community of Fells Point, past, present, and on into the future. History is best told in stories that resonate with the listener, whether it is through the written word or the virtual world of interactive websites and digital productions of sound and images. May we all work together in both a sustainable, physical, and virtual world to make it so. Thank you. presentation, I think that gives us all a, a new sense of what Fells Point was and, and was through history, not just in the 18th century, but 
you know, as you were describing, walking down Ann Street for 50 years, the buildings you saw, the people you saw, and how it sort of suddenly changed, changes from 1800 to 1850. So it's a whole other story, and certainly the, with the technology and with the information now available, I mean, it certainly gives us a, a lot to look forward to and sort of a, a lot to think about. So I'd like to thank you all for coming, but uh, our next uh, guest speaker will be Helena Hicks, and Helena will be uh, speaking on the last Thursday in April. I'm not sure if you remember the date. 30th. April 30th. I want to invite you all back here again for a, the continuing story of Fells Point. It's a wonderful story that people seldom hear. You've got a wonderful opportunity with some great people who know, you know, the history and have an academic approach to, to what it is, the stories that they're telling.